The following is a presentation of the Four Center podcast feed. From the center of the galaxy, this is the Four Center podcast feed, and this particular episode is questions of the Force and possibly answers. I'm Joseph Scriptshaw. I'm Kat Napsuck. We are going to sit down, look your questions straight in the eye, and give them the answers they deserve. A lot of great ones on the docket today. Yeah, very, very excited. So we want to let you know, as always, that today's podcast is brought to you by Audible. Get a free audiobook download and a 30-day free trial at audibletrial.com slash Four Center. Over 180,000 titles to choose from for your iPhone, Android, Kindle, or MP3 player. We are continuing to recommend Queen's Hope by E.K. Johnston. We have loved the two previous Padme novels by E.K. Johnston, so we can't wait to dive into that one. We'll be discussing it soon, and if you want to give it a listen, you can download that free audiobook by going to audibletrial.com slash Four Center. One more time, audibletrial.com slash Four Center. Free audiobook, Padme. Yay! (laughs) <laughs> any other thoughts ken uh no i am uh i have about 100 pages into that book can't wait to discuss it uh which we will uh next week here in four center yep yep uh as we record the uh thor love and thunder uh trailer just dropped with some excellent natalie portman content so it's just gonna be a it's gonna be a natalie portman week <laughs> and i'm excited for it and I crack that book open and try to read it probably in one sitting so I can just really immerse myself in the world of there you Padme. go. There you go. All right, we're going to get into these questions. Uh, we have two from Twitter, as always, and two from our patrons on Patreon. We go first to Twitter and Mark Tourish. Mark says, if George Lucas signed a trilogy deal, what difference... What differences do you think he would have made? Would the first Death Star have survived until the third film, for example? Uh, this is a really great thought starter of the idea that uh, in back in the 70s, when uh, when the, the chance is given to Lucas, not based on the quality of the idea of Star Wars, but on Lucas himself, as the story goes, uh, if they said, in fact, not just one picture, a three-picture Star Wars deal, make them all, George, what would have been different? Uh, where do you go with this, Ken? Um, I, I I went to how hard is it to predict George <laughs> at times? It's really <laughs> tough. Uh, at times right? you you can you can uh, stretch out your thoughts from center the core goals of Star Wars and all that kind of stuff. And I, 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 I this question made me think a lot of the prequel era where early magazines started to say, "Hey, there's rumblings of the books. Here's what we think could happen based on." styles and choices George has made really fascinating stuff. And some of it was not accurate, but close enough from a, <laughs> a far perspective. So I felt like I was a, a I'm a sci-fi magazine in 1995 right now, Joseph. So that's where I started. <laughs> yeah. I think I, I start with just like what an amazing uh, question that is just culturally in the, the movie making business and the storytelling business, right. That mm-hmm. just how deeply unprecedented that would have been in the mid 70s like it was a huge risk to make the first one and i just think it's fascinating to remember that like a trilogy or a series is just sort of like well of course that's that's the the sparkle in every executive's eye that you'd get (laughs) you know a trilogy or a series but just thinking back to the mid 70s when a sequel was either just a shoddy quick (laughs) Mm -hmm. Uh, attempt to make another one or something like the James Bond series or, you know, going all the way back to like Thin Man of like, yeah, we follow these characters and they have another adventure. But the idea of a trilogy uh, that's, you know, three acts, three movies, uh, that was not in the popular consciousness, I don't think at all, uh, until the 80s. So really fascinating to see what would have been different if Lucas had been in that mindset of, I I have this approach I want to do. I want to tell this mythic tale that's actually also kind of instructive and inspiring for youth, but is also just a fun whiz bang adventure full of joy. And I'm going to update all the serials I love with actual good <laughs> effects. Mm. Yeah. Those are all the things that he accomplished and that he wanted to. And if on top of that, he was also, and I'm going to change the storytelling structure. <laughs> yeah. of yeah. Hollywood by doing a trilogy. 
you know, I think some of the way that the original trilogy worked out is because it was a surprise, right? That uh, there are a lot of happy accidents, right? That he was totally. able to do it. And then with, the, you know, the uh, the idea that he brought Lando in partially as a new character and partially just in case Harrison Ford was like, nah, I'm not coming back. <laughs> <laughs> I'll leave him in the ice cube. You know, a lot of happy mm-hmm. accidents. The evolution of Vader being Luke's father, of Luke and Leia mm-hmm. being siblings, all that stuff is kind of, happened because of the way that the this trilogy was made so yeah. for me that that's all the stuff i thought of to try to get even close to imagining what yeah. would he have done if he had the knowledge that he was going to make three instead of happening on these evolutions in response to working on each film yeah it, you're going to a really interesting part of this discussion where upon getting this great question from Mark, you do start you know, having fun with just the basic plots. Would the would the first Death Star have just been the big evil overhanging a lot of things? Uh, possibly, I don't think so necessarily. But but then you, 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 myth starts to m- meld with reality, right, Joseph? Where you're just like, well, yeah. So you could have moved the Vader reveal. Oh wait, but he didn't really even necessarily have the Vader reveal. To Luke. <laughs> oh my gosh! And you're and so you're playing this mental game with George. Uh, that's a great starting point, and 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 it's now even more of a guessing game. But I have some thoughts on where George might have done what he might have thought of doing. I should say, in, in about seventy five, if Alan Ladd says you got three to make it happen. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think uh, uh, I, I really want to hear the thoughts. So one thing that I do, I think that some of this question is coming from the fact that Lucas has said in interviews that he intended the Death Star to be like the big bad, the final thing that needs to be defeated. But then he put it in the first film because he would, didn't know if he's going to be able to make more. Right. And and because that's always his, his, been his like. Well, yeah, so that's so I put it. It was supposed to be the big ending anyway. So I put it back in Return of the Jedi and, you know, uh, for for. <laughs> people uh who were alive when people were actually mad at george lucas over return of the jedi which i swear to you happened um that was one of the things right like yeah instead of making up a new thing he just went like well i had to put it in the first film even though it was meant to be in the third film so then i just put it in the third film again oh george lucas um i swear i swear young listeners these things happened they were real but but me at seven was like oh but but it's a bigger one oh it's great Right. Oh, and and now I just I just love the the actual portrait of evil of like, well, you blew mm. up my big gun. So I'll make a slightly bigger one or an even yeah. bigger one or I'll put big guns on all these ships. My <laughs> only idea is a big gun. <laughs> yeah, that's all I have. Fear uh, that's that's what evil has a big weapon to, to cause fear. Anyway, so I, I, I just wanted to clarify. I think that's where this this is coming from, is that that tidbit yeah. that Lucas intended the Death Star for the third film. Yeah, sure, George. We know what you intended. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Um, <laughs> so, where do you go? What are your storytelling ideas? I, I and, and and having fun with this in this fantasy book and uh, approach uh, again. If uh, Laddie's saying this stuff, make three, make it happen. I love American graffiti. Go for it. I, I wonder if George really incorporates more of what, not just like what goes into the prequels plot wise, but just that spirit, that feeling of this is where the story starts. This is how things fell, and then you get more of a. Um, Rebellion is born in the second episode and in episode three. I'll, I'll, I'll follow that thread out there of uh, of the third Death Star being there, that being the final stand against evil. Maybe the Emperor's on that when every, all the things we could become familiar with, uh, you know, because of Return of the Jedi are there. I just wonder, and, you know, I love the Star Wars and I love the Dark Horse ad, uh, adaption of that. That was, uh, that was really interesting to read a few years back. Um, I wonder if how much of that survives and how much do we get, not necessarily young Anakin, not necessarily pod racing and uh, a bunch of Senate chamber stuff, but a little bit more of the fall, a little bit more of him explaining this is how this happens. And I'm going to start there and then we'll whiz bang a little bit in the second and, 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 and resolve it all in the third. Yeah. I mean, I, I think that is the real question is, Obviously, with the story he wants to tell and with the the prologue in the novelization that we know is credited to Lucas, but written by Alan Dean Foster, but still Lucas is directing it, that that prologue sets up the political picture, right? It tells a little bit of a, a version of the prequel story that it, the politics of it was important to George. But I think he also wanted to make a whiz bang adventure. And I think all yeah. of the people around him were like, George, that's nice that you got all your... <laughs> <laughs> ideas but yeah. but get this get this movie moving so it's exciting right uh yeah. so i think that would be the push pull because i kind of imagine like yeah it would still eventually morph into being 
absolutely about Luke and mm-hmm. him journey, joining the fight. But well, what fight would he join then? Like, um, probably yeah. it, it wouldn't have been called the Battle of Scarif at the time, but probably the Battle of Scarif, I think. the If the Death Star was the big thing at the end, probably that, like, the help that the princess desperately needs for, for Luke to get the call to adventure is they're making this awful weapon. We need the plans. Yep. Um, so I, I can see that. Uh, but then I can also see like, yeah, just more political scenes and more Palpatine backstory because Lucas yeah. wanted to, to set up what is, what is the tyranny? How, what does it look like? How does it work? Uh, maybe a little bit of, you know, Palpatine, still having his there's that line from vader there there'll be no one to stop us now right and Mm -hmm. i think that leans into palpatine dissolving the senate which is all just exposition (laughs) in a new hope but i wonder if we would see some of that of palpatine getting close to having the death star so he can get rid of this last shred of democracy and you can see that moment where it turns into a just a total total full uh uh you know Mm. tyranny yeah, and I, I don't. I think because you know we we know it exists in the prequels, and we know the scenes we love and the dialogue that's there for us to enjoy, or you know, at times pick apart. Let's be honest. Uh, I, I, I'm not. I'm not suggesting we get a safe and secure society beat at the beginning, but at the same time, maybe I am. Maybe he starts with a big fall. Maybe it is an opening 15 minutes of just the craziest sci-fi political falling of one uh, regime and 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 the beginning of this evil one, and from there. You know, uh, it's kind of a, you know, truncated version of everything that happened in episodes two and three. But then from there, he builds back up. And I I think you're right. I don't think it moves too far away from a Luke-like character. No. Uh, And whether it be a a young princess, like, again, again, going just to the Star Wars, the the, the original drafts, you know, which are, you know, deep in his yellow notepad of, uh, of ideas. You know, a young princess, the young all that stuff, I think, has to remain because that's what he was trying to do. So I think you're right about that. Yeah, update these these classic myths. I think it, it would ultimately be shaped very similarly. I think you could even have mm-hmm. Han. You could even have his yeah. his uh, moral doubt. Um, I think, totally. it, and the in the turnaround to help at the end, it's just sort of like what is what is the victory? Because I think that's also such a hugely important part of a new hope to make this splash and say, uh, "Yep, here here's a list of all of the." bad and dangerous things that really exist in the world is exemplified by this Mm. tyrannical uh, government. But here's Mm. this hope that you can make a difference. You know, it's not nihilism, it's hope. Uh, So I think Luke would still have some sort of victory. So I wonder if maybe like some of the ideas that ended up being in Splinter of the Mind's Eye, the novelization that was the backup (laughs) cheaper sequel, was that whole like, Luke is able to face Vader because there's this kyber crystal that enhances force power. So I wonder if you get like, Ooh, yeah, you know, uh, maybe, maybe it's the plans. Maybe it's the kyber crystal. Maybe that's the kind of mm-hmm. MacGuffin of like, in order to power this horrible weapon, they need the kyber crystal and you get an ending where, you know, Luke faces Vader in battle enhanced by the kyber crystal, like in Splinter of yeah. the Mind's Eye. Love that, and, and I, I'm, I, if I had to put some money down, I, I would say that Vader doesn't. It, it, it's not who Vader is now. You know, maybe it's just the evil, and then maybe he truly did kill Luke's father. I wonder if it just if that would have carried out. I, I obviously love where we go. I think it's even more powerful. But I just, yeah, you know, at that time, I don't think George necessarily had that in mind, and that that could be, you know, the justice for for Anakin. <laughs> killing this cyborg Vader or whatever it might be. Could be interesting. I don't know. Yeah, no, absolutely. I think the power of Vader being revealed as Luke's father is at least partially informed by the cultural response. You know, we all know mm-hmm. the the famous, you know, Lucas was a little worried about Vader. He's only actually got 12 minutes of screen time in the making of yeah. the thing. And it's when he pops into pop culture that he becomes like one of the great villains of all time of of cinema of all time and so that i think is partial part of what makes the 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 vader parentage reveal powerful of like we had a couple of years of people discussing what a great kind of return to classic storytelling you know uh alec guinness giving interviews going don't think about it too much it's a simple story of good and (laughs) evil and it it was that cultural reaction that lucas was able to turn on its head of like what Mm -hmm. if it wasn't as simple as you thought yeah. Yeah. No, I think you're right. And and it's it's fascinating. Happy accidents what you set up up, up top. And I think that yeah. works in, especially with the Leia stuff later. 
Yeah. Mm-hmm. And maybe Obi-Wan survives. Who knows? <laughs> My last yeah. thought. Yeah. Possibly. Just the first film. Just the first film. Yeah. He would have been like some lizard with four arms, but yeah, he would have survived. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Get Obi-Wan some spider legs, some robot spider <laughs> legs, right? <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. Any other thoughts on that question before we move on? Uh, no. What, what it was, uh, this was, I sat down to do the notes. I was like, we're starting off. This is a great leadoff hitter. It's going to get on base, still second score run. It's going to make my brain hurt because it really truly is. It, this is a great question that incorporates all that we know of the history of Star Wars and all that we think we know about George and what he will tell us at certain times on the journey about yep. what he was thinking. Yep. I greatly admire the man. He says things very, very uh, definitively in interviews and, and he says many different things too. So it is, yeah. uh, you know, I think at yeah. the end of the day, he he is an artist and, uh, and the different, you know, structure would have influenced him differently for sure in uh, definitely difficult to predict. <laughs> yeah. All right, we're going to move on to our next question. Uh, Carl Axon Franzon asks, uh, listening to uh, uh, your recent episode made me think, uh, what are the must-watch Clone Wars episodes, maximum of 12, to get ready for the <laughs> Kenobi series? Uh, Rebels Twin Sons, of course, also. So, yeah, this is, a. I suspect that we'll have some similar ones, but maybe I'll be yeah. surprised, Ken. Well, I, look, I think there's some ones that you, you kind of have to go to, and, you know, and I'm not going to lie. I, I typed up some articles to make sure I wasn't missing anything. And I think everyone kind of goes to some big same ones, right? as you should, right? As you should. So that's part of this. So, and, and I'm just, r- Twin Sons gets, uh, you know, put on the shelf. Like I said, we're talking about Clone Wars episodes. So I don't know. Do you want to just list the ones that we probably think are on each other's list? Is this a game of a uh, card game where we're <laughs> go fishing here? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think the thing is that yes, there, because the Clone Wars has Obi-Wan in many, many episodes and there are many amazing Kenobi moments. If you're just a fan of Kenobi, mm-hmm. uh, but there are only a few arcs that are Kenobi centric. Um, yeah. And tell us something new about the character or he is challenged in a way that he's not. I mean, there are many episodes where he's just great and he's just sassy Kenobi. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Telling yeah. Anakin how he's messing up. Uh, but for the ones that are extremely Kenobi-centric uh, and I think could really have bearing on the series or at least uh, add nuance, uh, is that first Mandalore arc, season two, uh, episode 12, The Mandalore Plot, uh, episode 13, Voyage of Temptation, and episode 14, uh, Duchess of Mandalore. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and then this is the one that uh, I'm sure I'm sure we have this one as well. Mm-hmm. The uh, the mall uh, arc, yep. uh, including season four, episode 22, uh, Revenge, which is the yep. first time that Kenobi and Maul encounter one another again. Mm-hmm. And then the four episodes, which are uh, the Maul takes Mandalore. Uh, Kenobi doesn't feature in all these episodes, but I think you really got to see all four in order, order to understand the great importance of the story to Kenobi. So that's uh, mm-hmm. season five, episode one, Revival. Season 5, episode 14, Eminence. Then uh, episode 15, Shades of Reason. And episode 16, The Lawless. The Lawless in particular being a huge one. Um, I also think episode 22, Revenge, is Mm -hmm. a really great and important one for Kenobi because I, until our recent Clone Wars report, uh, I had forgot how much Kenobi is uh, prepped to give in to actual desire for vengeance from all killing mm-hmm. Qui-Gon and learns early on in this small conflict that that is not a road I want to go down. And that's a really essential beat for Kenobi. It, it really is. And, 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 and because Carl put this, this just horrible, unfair limit of episodes on, I, I was trying to p- pick out specific ones and yeah, revenge and the lawless, I think specifically, but especially revenge. And I think you're right. I, I, in, in, it seemed like where they where they cross sabers again for the first time. That's so huge and something I think I kind of forgot until we did the Clone Wars report. Um, so I yeah, think it's going from there, yeah, yeah, and just it, it really shows a lot of who Kenobi is with that. Like I I have responsibility for this and how Maul is able to manipulate him mm-hmm. uh, and cause basically horrific damage to other people out of his desire for re- revenge and to draw Kenobi out. All that stuff. Um, yeah, so then the, the the place where we might differ, I don't know, is mm. I uh, to complete my twelve, uh, I included the um, the Kenobi undercover arc uh, from yeah. season four, where he transforms into a fake bounty hunter. Well, real bounty hunter, but it's yeah. fake to him. So that's season four, episode five, Deception. Episode sixteen, Friends and Enemies. Episode seventeen, The Box. Episode eighteen, Crisis on Naboo. Did you include that arc, Ken? I did include that arc. I, I think for some reason that one's 
it's not that it stands out more. Let me let me rephrase that. Before I finish that sentence, uh, the, the Maul and, and Satine stand out more than anything with the story of Kenobi. But there's just something about that as it relates to Anakin, and as we go into mm-hmm. Kenobi, that I think is just so valuable if you if you're trying to get that full picture. Yeah, I think w- w- what I totally agree, and I think what's really powerful about that arc is it's a portrait of a absolutely committed Jedi Knight. Obi Wan Kenobi, anything for the mission of, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Uh, oh, yeah, of course I'll go through this horrific process of transforming my body physically <laughs> yeah, <laughs> into yeah. a bounty hunter, and then I'll go through this really arduous task of trying to get these bounty hunters to trust me and not give away uh, that I'm a Jedi, but not let people die pointlessly all around me. It puts them under this real pressure cooker, and then the really big thing of like. Uh, no one will believe this if Anakin isn't upset, mm. you know, mm-hmm. and I know that that's what you're, you're talking about with yeah. how important it is to Anakin. But I think that is it. it, it we know that Kenobi thinks he failed uh, Anakin. Mm-hmm. He tells Anakin, I failed you. He says, so Luke, I thought I could train him as well as is Yoda. I was wrong. Kenobi thinks he made mistakes. And I think yeah. this arc might be one of those mistakes he made with Anakin. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, and how many times is he going to be in that cave thinking about this? <laughs> <laughs> yep. Yep. Uh, so w- what are the differences in your 12 list? Then? Yeah, no. Yeah. All those there, including the specific ones there. We're really clued on, on that. Thank you, Clone Wars report for helping me clue back in on the Clone Wars and Kenobi. Um, here's, here's where I went to uh, first. I can't believe I'm even saying this in 2022. I kind of even three, four years ago might've been like, you're crazy. Uh, the Clone Wars movie. <laughs> I really do think you want it. You get to see Kenobi. Um, Fighting that clone war, uh, you know, uh, sitting there with General Loesome, all that stuff. You get to see what he was and what uh, could be a shadow in the back of his head of, of uh, not that he was a great warrior. That's not probably what he thinks of himself, but of just what he was doing, what he was involved in. It just makes me think of Leia years ago. You served my father in the Clone Wars. So actually go see the Clone Wars and see it, uh, uh, see what's going on there. Yeah, no, I think that is that that's a really great choice. Like if I was pulling moments that the T with loathsome. Yeah. Right. <laughs> right. That is that is a big deal. Uh it's got some great sassy ventures interactions and yeah, mm-hmm. Kenobi being like, Well, this is what we're doing, it's a war, and <laughs> make the best of it. <laughs> yeah. Here I am being the general. Uh I think that's a, a really interesting pick. Yeah. So and then and to kind of keep it with that, if if you're looking at specific Clone Wars episodes. Uh, you know, I, I, I'm not gonna lie. I was trying to pull in some, you know, get outside the box a little bit. I, I put uh, uh, cat and mouse and hidden enemy, which are like mm-hmm. the first two early on. Again, kind of more in line with the Clone Wars thing. Uh, landing at Point Rain is another one of the just like, you know, stuff going on with Anakin, stuff going with Kenobi. I put the lost one, uh, which we are about to dive in soon. Uh, on Clone Wars report mm-hmm. that is a lot of the Zyphodia stuff, and that makes me just think of. Dooku and Kenobi, uh, you know, and attack the clones and Dooku kind of saying, I'm going to make you question your trust, uh, give you bits of truth, bits of lies and trying to evoke your master's name, all those kind of things. So just Zyphodeus and, and a little bit more of a plot and it not, you know, not that it's a true crime murder mystery, but you know what I mean? We're just the big picture for Kenobi and, and him trying to learn more about it and learning more about it. Um Overall. And then my final one, I actually, I wanted to put something from the Mortis arc, but trying to keep it to Carl's limit here, which I think I've <laughs> passed, whizzed by. I put the altar of Mortis, uh, mm. which has a lot, a uh, lot of stuff of Kenobi in a cave. Uh, <laughs> and and if we're going to spend some time with Kenobi, Kenobi in a cave and any kind of Qui-Gon force ghost talk and anything like that, uh, that makes me think of altar of Mortis as well. Yeah, no, I think that's pretty vital too, because it is, it is Kenobi, uh, r- questioning you know whether he actually mm-hmm. saw Qui-Gon whether that's actually possible and uh, you know uh, looking a little bit more head-on at the whole chosen one uh, yeah. prophecy uh, so yeah I think that's a great choice um, yeah I just went with the arcs the three arcs mm. <laughs> well you, you, you hit and, your and limit maybe <laughs> maybe I'm maybe I'm wasting uh, spaces with a, a couple of the episodes in the Mal takes Mandalore arc but I just kind of feel like it's it's vital to oh, no, yeah, you're feeling right. the overall the overall flow um mm-hmm. but i did cheat and do some bonus ones if you're like okay i did my 12 but i got time <laughs> yes yes <laughs> if you're looking for some that are just a little bit more celebration and uh and flavor of kenobi uh, i think season one season one episode 15 trespass um 
that's really Anakin in Obi Wan episode, but it's the 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 one where the Talls uh, are being attacked by the Pantorans, and uh, it, it, they mm-hmm. Obi Wan ha- and Anakin have the great uh, cold weather gear, but a lot of great banter with uh, Obi Wan and Anakin, and really showing Obi Wan right. as a more kind uh, philosopher and and trying to bridge the gap and all that. So I love that one. Like and then that. Uh, season two, episode seventeen, uh, Bounty Hunters. There's just some really great. Uh, fun and banter uh, mm. with Obi Wan and uh, Sugi, uh, the lead that's bounty right. hunter. Of course, some Embo. Uh, but yeah, that's just a a great. Um, that that's when we're also where Obi Wan is really kind of wrestling with the philosophy of Jedi of how much can we fight a war versus train them to protect themselves, all that kind of stuff. I love it. That's great. No bonus bonus counts. Bonus counts. Yeah, yeah. Do you have any any other bonuses? <laughs> <laughs> the only one I the only one I put I I because we're gonna review it. It's it's all Yoda. It's all Yoda, baby. But we might need to review uh, or include voices, especially after we review it. We're getting to that some of that stuff with Yoda and what he learns, and then sits uh, uh, you know uh, on the on the Ten of Eve three, right? Not the not four. And yeah. he says, uh, "Hey, I got a final mission for you, Obi Wan. I got a final lesson. Um, that could that could mean something. I mean, it's more again. It's like it's Yoda, but." Who knows? Maybe we'll get some insight and we'll see what that uh, if it has anything to do with Kenobi in the desert. That's a really good point because I I have a hope, if not a prediction, that Obi-Wan's training to commune with Qui-Gon is either a motivating factor at the beginning or mm-hmm. I would love it if it was a breakthrough at the end. But I, I'm They've been doing yeah. such a good job with the live action, especially with the, you know, Filoni round of really tying, if not to direct references to the philosophy. And that uh, that three episode arc really does outline the the philosophy of the four spirits. Yeah. 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 I mean, yeah. Uh, who knows what Kobe's going to have, ha- what he will have learned, what he will say about what he's learned from Yoda. If he'll get any information, have to discover himself. You're right. And I love that. I, I, I kind of like your idea of it being a, not a reward, but something at the end of the journey versus something at the beginning. But any Qui Gon, any even the mention of the name Qui Gon is going to get me excited in the Kenobi series. Yeah, I just think communing with uh, uh, a spirit, <laughs> if that is a, mm-hmm. if that's and and preparing yourself to become one yourself, that seems like you need to be at at least some bit, a uh, tiny bit of peace. And since we're meeting Obi Wan agitated um, yeah. and depressed, it's really making sense to me that he would. Uh, you know, break through and have this victory of communing uh, with Qui Gon at the end, which is another way to give it a sense of hope. Yeah, no, I, I, I think, I think when you said that a, a couple uh, episodes ago, or when we were breaking down the trailer, it just makes it makes so much sense, man. And you say a lot of things that make sense, but that makes a lot of sense <laughs> to me. Of, of just you're emotionally clogged, man, and you got to take some force fiber pills. Sorry, I went there, and and then you could talk to Qui Gon. You got to clear yourself, and it, you can't hear the force. You can't hear. Not that Kenobi's going to be disconnected from the force, but it just makes a lot of sense. And there's some about Yoda at the in the in the arc. Again, it's been a while since we've watched those episodes, and we're going to dig dig into them very soon here on Cold War Support. Mm-hmm. We're three episodes away. Yeah. I, I think there's something about Yoda confronts some stuff and, and I think gets a little clearer and, and some and gets some insight. So I, I it's it's just fascinating. He explicitly goes through a, a trial. Yeah. 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 Absolutely. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So oh man. I'm so looking forward to it. And I, I love this new <laughs> way of thinking about one of the fundamental <laughs> themes of Star Wars you've introduced <laughs> that uh that Sorry. a way to talk about uh, overcoming your dark side and reclaiming a sense of hope is uh, is fiber pills. So uh, <laughs> look, look forward to our review of Star Wars, A New Fiber Pill, coming soon. I'm gonna, I, I request Brian Ward to make a fiber pill <laughs> bottles, uh, force fiber pill <laughs> bottles. There you go. Force fiber pills. Take your pills, Obi-Wan, <laughs> and you too will become one with the force. All right. On that uh, wonderfully weird note, we're going to take a quick break and we'll be back in a moment. And we are back to take more questions of the force. These questions come from our patrons on Patreon. We're going first to Brittany Lockwood. Brittany says, which emotions do you think R2-D2 is programmed to experience Mm. and express? 
and which do you think are a result of his experiences in unwiped memory? <laughs> mm. uh, I mm. love the turn of phrase, unwiped memory. I think that is what uh, R2's uh, autobiography should be called, <laughs> unwiped memory. <laughs> the uh, tale yeah. of an astromech. But this is a great question to think about of, of what's programmed and what is experiential. Mm. Yeah, what what does his uh, sort of AI programs frighteningly adapt and, and grow? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. So just starting out as, you mm-hmm. know, a a droid in the service of uh, of Naboo um in royalty mm-hmm. uh on a ship, what what do you think his like initial operating parameters are? What is R2 supposed to be that he then excels beyond? Yeah, and then I, you know, it's, this was also a, a lesson in let me look up what actually are listed emotions. Let me watch a Disney Pixar movie to learn what's what counts. Because I, I, but I think I, I, I get to those. I think in the beginning though, it's 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 emotions slash mandates in a way of of yeah. uh, uh, I put things like uh, you know strength and courage uh, in 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 that uh, you know in duty. Uh, so loyalty, and again, I know these aren't direct emotions. I'm just throwing a bunch of stuff on the wall here. Um, and and, and uh, connection uh, is something there too. His a sense of uh, R2's a, a, an individual in his own way. We know that. Sassy is one thing he's probably programmed to have as well. Uh, but I think there's something about um, purpose, uh, you know, steadfast kind of nature in him, in his programming that drives him forward and and and. I, I I think uh, his bravery, which often finds him all through the Clone Wars, doing a lot of things we see him in the original trilogy uh, doing, you know, goes goes the way, knows where he needs to go, uh, thinks outside the box, takes big, big risks. I think all that's in there, whether they're straight up emotions. I'm just saying that's part of his programming, part of who he is in the beginning. Yeah, no, I, I agree with you that the two words that I came up with are loyalty and bravery. I think mm-hmm. he's programmed to be loyal and brave. I think those are uh, Naboo, Nubian values. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I think it's also what is needed practically to do the job, right? Of yeah. like, we're in a dangerous situation, at least the first job we see him do, right? Of go yeah. out on cling to the ship in the middle of space under blaster fire and fix this. Don't question. <laughs> go yeah. forward and do your duty. Um, and I think, you know, there is no fear. There is just a classic R2 right out of the, out of the box when we meet him of, I, I will go forward under dangerous circumstances and I will do what needs to be done. Um, and he gets, uh, you know, rewarded with that uh, compliment. I'm paraphrasing of what, of a particularly well put together droid. Mm-hmm, <laughs> mm-hmm. And, you know, if you want to go deep on this, that, that suggests that, well, yo, look, we try to program them all to be uh, loyal and brave, um, really be able to focus under pressure about just getting their job done. And uh, some of them are better at that than others. And this one's great. <laughs> this one's the best. <laughs> this one's great at it. Well, this one's yeah. really well built, well made. Yeah, yeah. 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 So I think that's where he starts. What of the R2 that we know do you think starts to come out of all of his lived experiences in yeah. the fact that he is uh, <laughs> he is the anti Din uh, Jarn. If Din Jarn does not know Star Wars, uh, R2-D2 <laughs> knows the hell out of Star Wars. He does. And this is he, he's got a software update that hits right when you're sitting down to play the video game and you have to wait a half hour. He's updating <laughs> right now. I, I, I think... I, I was going to put, uh, there's a sense of um, frustration in him at times, maybe that the big picture, and this is where it comes with, with art with three PO and a new hope. But that to me is, is a byproduct of, he now has a, a good sense of calmness and patience because he knows he's in for the long haul. Uh, even yeah. though he's, he's going to be at times be rash, not out of Han Solo rashness, but just like, Hey, the big picture. I think he knows this is a long play. It was going on. So there's, there is a bit of calmness under pressure and some patience that's uh, built into him, I think. And also I think because of that, he has, his empathy is big uh, and and the bigger picture and, and, and trying to do what is right. I think, because he wants to help those around him and the galaxy at large. Mm, yeah, no, I, I love that. I think uh, the first thing I thought about of lived experience is the same as you of like, I, I described it as a uh, tenacity, right? Of that. Uh, if he's programmed to like, hey, when you're instructed to uh, do something, uh, don't have fear, roll forward and or rocket forward and do it and get it done. And mm-hmm. I think over his lived experience, he's got this uh, tenacity and he's a self-starter. 
<laughs> I think maybe he was programmed to be like, when we ask you to do something, do it. And I think now he's like, I take the initiative always. I see what needs to be yeah. done. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And I go do it even if nobody else sees that's what needs to be done or maybe 3PO or even somebody else is like, should you be doing that? He's like, no, I know that's uh, I'm I'm going to go do that and I'm going to do whatever it takes uh, to get it done kind of vibe. Um, I think you're describing it as patience. I think that's great. Uh, there's that passage, I believe, I can't remember which book. I think it's a Leia book where she's talking about, like, haven't given R2 anything to do. So he's just off, like, memorizing uh, yeah. new systems in case he needs to know them. <laughs> like this idea yeah. that he's like your friend who's like, uh, you tell them, like, well, uh, for this weekend, you know, I really needed to decompress. I, I took a break. And, like, what did you do? And they're like, I needed to decompress, too. So I remodeled my entire house. And I, you know, yeah. went for eight. Uh, <laughs> yeah. I, and I did and I, three marathons and, you know, learned to cook a new food. Like, and, oh, that was your relaxing weekend? Like, that <laughs> is R2. Um, uh, yeah. 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 And then the lived experience, I think, also has just made him uh, frustrated and grumpy and giving him that potty mouth. <laughs> oh yeah. Yeah. Right. He, he, he's, yeah. Sorry, he's, sorry. he's been there. He's seen it and he's got yeah. an opinion about it. What, what were you going to say? No, no, the frustration is big. I, and I think that's always probably, probably been there, but I, I don't necessarily think the R2 we meet, is, you know, coming out of Naboo is, is overly or easily frustrated. Right. I think he's, mm -hmm. he's, he's just discovering his big purpose. He's been probably pretty bored for a while. He's like, he's probably like, yes, action. I get to go out on a ship while I'm being, I did lose some friends, but yay, you know, <laughs> uh, but I think it starts to uh, happen. I mean, all the things he's seen and all the characters he knows, he's the droid who knows too much, uh, but is able to keep it secret. So I think, I think that is true. I also put these, these two uh, final ones here. Um, and, and hear me out on this. There's a little bit of fear that has emerged, but I don't mean fear that's going to lead to bad things. I think I'm trying, maybe I'm trying to explain it more as like a, a real understanding and almost a, uh, you have to respect the evilness out there. He's, he has an understanding of it, which is drives him forward even more. It's, it's a, I don't want to say healthy fear, but you know, that thing of just like, Hey, this ain't fun and games anymore. <laughs> um, I was on Mustafar. Uh, I saw how things can get, and and whether he knows uh, Anakin's Vader, Vader's Anakin, um, doesn't really matter to me. He just he's he's seen the you know I've seen some bleep, man. I, I I've saw I saw that safe and secure society <laughs> shroud fall down. You have to take it serious. You have to have a healthy respect for it. From in a way, we're going to topple it. We're going to take it down. That's why I'm here. That's why I'm running off on my missions in the desert. But I understand, and I've seen it. Yeah. Do you, you think know? he's kicking himself? He's like, I rescued that a-hole Palpatine from the Zillow beast, man. <laughs> yes. I should yeah. not have flown him out of there. I should have let that Zillow beast eat Palpatine. Yeah, a little bit of that. <laughs> and, and, and all that leads to the, the final one. I think I think he's, uh, I'm sure he's always had this in him, but I think he has a real appreciation for joy. Uh, mm. You know, he, he's here to help. Uh, restore hope to the galaxy as well. And because of that, at the end, when he's dancing with Ewoks, he's feeling joy. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, I think he I, I think just, uh, yeah, strongly emotional. Right. He he reacts positively when he sees people uh, he loves. Or he he has empathy when somebody else is sad. He's got his great little moan. <laughs> yes. <laughs> you yes. know, uh, I think he has he I, I think he is, you know, it's got that tenacious uh, vibe. I love him being in charge of the all those droids building. Uh, mm -hmm. the hut on on Luke's Jedi planet that we see in in the book of Boba Fett episode, he, like he's like the you know proud construction <laughs> manager, you know. Yeah. But I, but I think he also kind of he enjoys uh, making Din Jar and wait, you know. <laughs> oh yeah, I'm yeah, gonna so teach a, you patience. A lot of emotions, including here's one I think that he develops from his experience: a slight penchant for vengeance. Um, <laughs> Oh yeah. He uh when when he when he gets freed, he does not need on on Endor, uh he does not need to zap the Ewok, but he does. <laughs> <laughs> he, he's not escaping or saving. He's just lashing out. <laughs> I don't disagree with that at all. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And final thing for me, I think, with this unwiped memory and with kind of a character trait, I think with the amount that he starts to experience and like knowledge and plans that he starts to collect i love that it becomes a plot point in the clone wars where anakin is breaking protocol by not wiping his mind he's not yeah. supposed to know that much it's dangerous because if he's captured uh there he knows too much yeah. um but that 
that scene then is a development of his character that he has become this this uh, hoarder of knowledge that that is part of what is making him develop and what what's making him stand out and be capable of things like rescuing uh mace and anakin mm-hmm. in that arc uh, mm-hmm. i think mm-hmm. his unwiped memory is a, is a big part of of who he becomes that he be he values like know everything hoard it <laughs> yeah. i need to be a thousand uh you know encyclopedias in one and i do like the the idea it's been talked about a lot um i think among fans the idea that he is a bit fragmented that he's got all these memories and all these systems and all these protocols and he's seen and he's experienced so much and i think he is incredibly um uh, empathetic to the moment but i also like the idea that he's maybe through all of it doesn't quite understand all of human life. Like he knows when somebody's happy, when somebody's sad, when they need something, but like maybe just kind of can't even comprehend what Anakin is doing on Mustafar. Like mm. that just doesn't compute kind of, yeah. I, there's something I like about that, that he truly sees and feels emotions in the moments, but it's kind of, maybe some of the undercurrents don't make sense to him. I like that. I like that. Yeah. Yeah. He, he doesn't have full understanding of, of what, what they're going through. Yeah. That, that, that kind of makes some sense. Uh, yeah. Yeah. I, I'm there on that. And it also might, might allow him to, when I, like when I mentioned fear, like it, it's not a fear that holds him back. It's just, again, it's understanding the bigger picture where he just, he might be like, what, why are you afraid? You just go on the ship and you, you try to save it. Yeah. <laughs> no, I mean, he, he, no, I mean, he's, he's got moments of like, uh, uh, I think reasonable fear. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, like, yeah. He, I he loves to hide like, from the Tuscan Raiders. Yeah. Yeah. Oh yeah, he knows the hide from the Tuscan Raiders. He knows it's a problem that uh, at the beginning of Revenge of the Sith, when Obi Wan's talking too loud on the comm and exposing his position, <laughs> yeah. he has lots of great moments. Though. Like, yeah. uh, it, it, I love it when he's like, "Yeah, I know, I know, I know that Bib Fortuna is not the kind of person you want stroking your dome." <laughs> Mm-mm. Mm-mm. No. Uh, any other thoughts on R 2s development before we move on to our final question? Well, here's here's my one. It, it, it's just got me thinking about R two, all his emotions and what he you knows. I don't know if he feels stress or feels the weight of everything that he has inside him. Do you think at any point he has just confessed something to like some random gonk droid, like just sitting around? He's like, hey, let me tell you something. Let me tell you something. Here, let me go back to the beginning of who's who in the zoo. Here, here's what we got. I just got to tell someone. I think so. I really, there's something about R2 that just, he, he does just feel like this, like, uh, kind of talkative lifer, uh, mm-hmm. that's just been everywhere and seen everything and, and knows some stuff and is happy to share it. Like, I think, you know, I think, I think some gonk droid just uh, plug it into something and R2'd be like, you want to talk about yeah. plugging into things? Let me tell you about the time I plugged into <laughs> X, Y, or Z, and then this happened, you know? Like if he got in that cab in the Clone Wars era uh, with our favorite <laughs> cabbie, the one that, uh, you know, uh, uh, Fives just said everything to, uh, yeah. I, I think R2, it would be a dangerous combination. Yeah, I think once you get him going. Mm. Yeah. 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 <laughs> I love that. He, R2's a talker. Yeah. Uh, he's got a lot to say to Luke on Octo. Uh, moving on to our final question. This comes to us from Commander Cloud. Uh, Commander Cloud says, Greetings, Force-Centered Ones. As Kenobi nears its release, or wraps up, depending on when this airs, uh, we do take mm-hmm. a, a while to get to all of our uh, patron questions because we have so many good ones, and we just try to take them uh, in, in order, and sometimes uh, we fall behind. But we are still before Kenobi. Uh, so Commander Cloud continues, I look forward to nearly all of my idle speculations being shot down in flames. <laughs> it's nothing new as I've been way off in the past and not just speculations like Ray is Luke's daughter or that's Plagueis' staff. As a know-it-all punk 12-year-old, I remember watching the trailer to episode two and thinking, well, that gave it away. All the Jedi are going to die and the Empire will rise. It's right there in the title, Attack of the Clones. No clue what they're going to do in episode three now. So, what were some of your most memorable speculations? Which ones make you laugh or cringe or forged you into the responsible speculators of today? Thanks, uh, and thank you, too, for teaching me to speculate responsibly, a phrase I often recall in daily life and not just because it's on my keychain. May the force of others be with you. Thank you very much, uh, Commander Cloud, for the stories and for the questions. Uh, Ken, where do you go with this? What are some of your uh, speculations that you uh, that you look back on? Where do I go with this? Where do I go with this? A hall of shame is where I go. <laughs> I sit there. No, first of all, it's just part of the fun. And I, I'm with you. I'll confess, uh, you know, you were a 12-year-old punk kid. I was a, 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 a quiet uh, nerd in my mid-20s. And I thought the same thing about Attack of the Clones after that trailer. I was like, this <laughs> this is it. It's the destruction of the Jedi. Oh, my God, we're seeing it. 
what are they going to do? Uh, you know, um, I was right there with you on that. So everything else, though, is uh, it's, you know, fortunately, Joseph, you and I have a lot of our predictions and thoughts and wants and expectations on record. Um <laughs> Several different shows across many platforms and mediums, so it can get uh, it, it can get uh, embarrassing. But it's part of the fun. So even though I think I'm overall a little embarrassed by just my focus on it, I had a job that had to focus on it, and that just kind of leads to a lot of wild thoughts. That said, and I've mentioned that before here on the show, so I wanted to get that out there. But maybe I'll go to some specifics here. I was part of the team that thought that gravestone on Octo's got to be someone important. Mm. And I spent a <laughs> lot of time wondering what it was and who it was. And even after people were like, no, no, I visited the island. It's just there. It's probably part of the scenery. I was like, well, they've, they've engraved on it. Wedge Antilles or something. You know, I was, <laughs> it's big, dark letter. Like I, I was right there. That was of all, you know, this, the plague of staff of it all, blah, blah, blah. And yeah. The Ray, the Ray's parents, when you told me that's a separate uh, category. Um, but man, that, that Luke was mourning over someone in that final shot to me for a long time. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, I think for me, like recently, um, I liked the idea that in Book of Boba Fett, when we saw uh, Din having the armor forge these little circles of Beskar mm -hmm. uh, for Grogu, yeah. I just became enchanted with the idea that that was a necklace to hang the the silver ball from, <laughs> <laughs> she which still was needs. deeply wrong. It was obviously chainmail. I was, I, I, I that was a moment where. I didn't speculate uh, uh, irresponsibly in that I was, I really thought that's what it is. That's what it should be. And then I was annoyed. It would, mm -hmm. that's one of the example of like, uh, I took a flight of fancy of something that I thought was fun. And mm -hmm. I focused on that rather than what was pretty clear that it, it's, it's chain mail. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right. No. It looked like chain mail. And uh, yeah. yeah, so I, I want to be clear about this. I don't mind being wrong and I don't mind speculating. Yeah. That is the fun, but I think it, it, the, the danger of the speculation is becoming attached to it, you know? Yeah, no, without a doubt. But I think, look, and, and, and there's been some recent ones. I think uh, listen, me having this opportunity to really listen to older episodes of to, to fix our transition to a cast, I, I've heard you and I and Jennifer say some real spot on stuff. I've heard you. I mean, you had almost down to the dialogue of what Bo-Katan was going to say to Din Djarin. <laughs> like, uh, <laughs> I want to prop you up for that. And you, we've also had some crazy ones in the sense of, I think, especially in the last couple of years here in Force Center, we're, we're looking at themes. We're looking at the why. Grogu with a necklace, that's a big why. There's a, there's a lot of why that goes into that thought and that prediction and desire uh, so I, I think that's some of the big swings we take come out of tracing the themes and, and seeing where they you can take them. Yeah. And, and also just like for me, that was about the the uh, unresolved thread of the ball, you know, um, but uh, <laughs> but but we got some resolution there in a different in a different way. Um yeah, and I think another one for me that I think about a lot is um, in the lead up to Last Jedi. Um, in the for the trailer release, there was the oh the the Jedi need to end. There was a kind of thought of like oh well, we're, this is going to be the tale of a a new idea emerging. And I think uh, uh, of like well, we're still going to be light side force users, but maybe it's going to you know morph into something different. Um, I don't think that is the story. I don't think that's the intent. I we talked about this a lot, but I think I think the story is the core ideas of the Jedi are great, and the problems happen when uh, people f stray from that path. I think that's the story the train that uh, Ahsoka has been on. I think that is the through line of Luke. It's not that all of the core ideas are bad. I think certainly the tale of the prequels of that they it's not that the core ideas are bad. It's that they deviated too much from them and they didn't question right. uh, enough. Um, so I think that was kind of off in terms of um, the big picture of Star Wars, uh, in my opinion. I, I recognize we have listeners who, who probably disagree with that. And I, I, mm -hmm. that that is totally understandable. But then also with Last Jedi, I think I had the, um, the I, I it wasn't even speculation. It was desire, which is different. Mm -hmm. I wanted Luke to have been on Octo for a proactive purpose. Mm. And I think that's because I was kind of clinging to like, I know he probably, he's probably just like real upset that 
<laughs> everything yeah. that we know from Force Awakens, that uh, one student turned against him, oh, his nephew, and destroyed the school that he was uh, yeah. trying to build. We got all that information in The Force Awakens. So why is Luke all alone on an island bummed out? Wasn't a mystery, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, but I think I had that desire to be like, but I want him to be this hero. And then mm. the ironic thing for me, I always think about this one is I was kind of imagining, I want him to be there for a purpose. Um, mm -hmm. cause I want him to be a hero ultimately. And on, on one hand it, it was wrong. Cause it did not Ray showed it up. And he's like, yes, I've been meditating on this, <laughs> the secret Octo Kyber crystal and blah, blah, blah. You know, no, it, yeah. he, it, and, but it still ended up being exactly correct that he had proactive purpose. He, he wants to, uh, stop. He's, he's afraid that he, will do more damage if he intervenes. So he's mm -hmm. got the proactive purpose to, to, to stop any more damage from happening from himself, from the Jedi. Uh, but then of course the uh, whole story is he learns that it's wrong to hide. Uh, he learns that it's wrong to, to just listen to his fear and the great triumph of the last Jedi, which I have loved from the first viewing is that he, he reconnects to his Jedi values and his, and his true purpose in a way that works for him. So that's one of those, like desires that was both wrong and then correct. I got what I wanted, but in a different way than I expected. Mm. Yeah. No. Oh, yeah. Yeah. You're on the, you're on the, you're on the playing field. <laughs> I'm on the playing field. I'm on the playing field. Yeah. Um, and I think for me, it's also just, uh, we've talked a lot about the whole speculate responsibly thing. Uh, but I think I've been thinking about it more recently about how much the last Jedi discourse not even any of the storytelling in The Force Awakens or The Last Jedi. But for me, the discourse in the lead up to Last Jedi really drove home what you were saying about, about the, the conflicts in the themes and mm -hmm. the uh, needs of the characters that the why is so much more important than the who or the what. Mm -hmm. The who and the what is really fun to speculate on. And I, and I don't think we, we should ever not have fun it's right. you know we get questions about who might pop up in mandalorian season three and that's really fun to guess if a mm -hmm. a story does set up a mystery of somebody is behind something but we don't know who it's really fun to think of who yeah. i think where the problem comes in is that uh we're, we're set up to wonder about stories we love uh the answers are often uh who or what and we're wondering about that um, but I think because social media lacks nuance mm -hmm. and because clickbait is rewarded uh, by algorithms, I think we've put so much surface on the focus or, yeah. or so much focus on the surface question of who or what that I think we've lost a little, uh, a little too much cultural focus on uh, the answers only matter because what they mean mm -hmm. for the story and the characters and any sort of uh, ideas that the story wants to communicate about who we are as humans, what our culture is, <laughs> yeah. why we exist, what we should be trying to do. Those are the things that matter. You know, I, yeah. I, I think uh, Alex's great video that he did, uh, uh, Star Wars Explained about Cad Bane, it was just such a great example of, of somebody who is a leader in the, in the YouTube field. Mm -hmm just speculating so damn responsibly of like, I do want Cad Bane to show up. Mm -hmm. I like Cad Bane. He's awesome. He's cool. But why would he show up? Here are the reasons it would matter to Boba Fett. That was such a great video. And I just, I, I, I just, I want us to be uh, doing more things like that. The who and the what is fun, but we can't uh, leave the why unattached from it. No. And when you, and you, when you weigh things by the why, then you either find the meaning and it doesn't mean you always agree with it or, or that's what you want, but like the great cameo debate and, and what's nostalgia and what's to serve the story and what's, you know, that nostalgia back then. I think that's where, we, you know, you can, you know, just analyze it better for yourself about what you actually like when you weigh the why. Uh, and, and I'll, you know, if you catch me, you know, if you're chatting Star Wars with me on the, the porch of the comedy store and you have a great theory, I'll, I'll nod and smile and think it's great. Uh, but I think in the last year or two, uh, I, I, I will now, take a sip of my drink of choice and say, but why? Tell me why. <laughs> Tell me why. And then we can have that conversation. And a lot of folks have the great answers, by the way. Um, yeah. Think of the why. Weigh the why. But yeah, I, th I think that fuels a lot of it. And it, it didn't fuel a lot of my predictions in the past. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, me too. 
<laughs> Me too. Uh, any other thoughts on this uh, great question about uh, speculating responsibly? Well, yeah, yeah, I just here's here's some. Can I share some misfires? Oh yeah. <laughs> um, I was definitely on a Ezra Bridger is in episode seven, probably uh, <laughs> Max von Sydow. Definitely thought oh. that was going to work. I don't know nice. if the math worked out. I, uh, uh, man, I, I really was convinced uh, Zier Leonis was going to be related to Finn in some way, which is uh, mm. not the best thought, too. Uh, but also, it made some sense. We we thought it was uh, more connected, right? This is all going to flow into something, and and I was that was that was off base. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, in a lot of ways. Uh, yes, yeah. Uh, yeah. Any other misfires? Those are good yeah. ones. Yeah. Uh, yes. Uh, so I was on a, uh, there was an old movie debate show I would always be on and uh, they brought me in specifically to be a ringer for uh, the, this question of uh, we'll predict what's going to happen. Pitch episode eight. I had, I had a great one. I won the round, by the way. Uh, but it, it was based <laughs> on this idea, this, uh, you know, some things are right. There's a vacuum of power and you're know, not right, but just, you know, with a little bit of what we got in Last Jedi, what's going on. The First Order is trying to t- claim the, 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 the spot there, take the power. But I had this idea of kind of this three-way dance. It was, uh, you got Luke fighting uh, Kylo, but Kylo's fighting Benicio Del, Del Toro's character, who's very <laughs> clearly going to be Snoke's other apprentice. And then Luke and maybe Kylo fight Snoke. Now my question to myself is, where's Rey in, in all that? I don't remember where I put Rey in that story, but probably <laughs> there's somewhere, which is why it was all bad. So uh, yeah, uh, it was a great, great thought, uh, big thought, a lot of... Uh, Pieces on the board, a lot of uh, a lot of what, a lot of hows, but not a lot of whys. And so there's that one. And then the final, oh, the final one. I, I put this down. The Phantom Menace trailer. Oh, I was I, and I've said this before, even recently. As much as I love the Phantom Menace and keep loving the Phantom Menace more and more, I think it's an important film now. Uh, always, you know, that's been growing with me. But even back when I didn't like, it, I used to always say, "Man, that trailer's so great. I love the trailer. I want to know what that movie is." What I meant by that is. It, 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 over the years, it's either been a great insult or just me wondering. I just, I that 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 trailer, all of them, but the, I'll put all the trailers together. I just, I had the movie in a different order. I thought the pod race was a chase. I did think there was going to be a big war in Naboo, but not the one we got. Not let of a blockade, but people needed to go there maybe after some people scared. I don't know. And then I did think because of uh, Palpatine said wipe them out, uh, all of them. I thought the Jedi were going to start going in Phantom. <laughs> and I imagine all of those uh, assumptions affected your first feeling of The Phantom Menace. Yes, an early <laughs> lesson in when your expectations can hamper your enjoyment. Yeah, yeah, and that's a, to, to, to bring it back to uh, this great question from Commander Cloud about Kenobi, I think that that's the thing, too, is just always realizing, like, there are a lot of ways to tell a story. So if you have, like, a, a character that you want to appear or mm-hmm. a... Like with Kenobi, like uh, we're talking about that. What if what if his ability to finally connect with Qui-Gon is a, a sign of his his success and coming to peace at the end of it? That's mm-hmm. an idea I love. That is one way to write that story. Yeah. But I don't want to limit myself to. But what if the writers have a different idea? You know, it, mm-hmm. putting putting any story together is uh, putting together a, a puzzle. And sometimes a piece that's cool just doesn't fit. You know, Mm -hmm. Uh, and that's the other thing I think to really remember about speculating is like your example of, yeah, it'd be really cool if uh, the three day fight between Luke, Kylo and (laughs) DJ (laughs) Benicio Del Toro, uh, uh, Snoke's uh, second apprentice. That's really cool. That's Mm -hmm. a piece of a puzzle just floating with no connection to anything else. So I think even when you you come up with an idea of a of a puzzle piece that has a why and Mm -hmm. is cool, just remember that like that that is that's a puzzle piece that's not the whole story so like if if something i'm really excited about or hopeful about for kenobi because i have so many <laughs> speculations about kenobi yeah. if if one of those puzzle pieces doesn't fit that's fine i just want to enjoy the story that is being told and if you know yeah. if one cool thing doesn't happen it's probably because it didn't fit in the story you know i just yeah. I, I there isn't there isn't uh, I, in my opinion, there isn't right and wrong. Stories are subjective. They are flowing, organic things t- told by humans or a group of humans that hopefully a little bit of those human souls are in and those souls mm-hmm. are different than mine. And that's what makes it interesting. I, yeah, yeah. I just really want to approach things not as, 
right and wrong. They should have done X and they did Y instead. Therefore, it is bad. I personally just don't, I don't want to be that way. <laughs> yeah. No. I want to, I want to feel like this is flowing and organic. And I thought it would be cool if the river twisted this way around a mountain. But you know what? Mm-hmm. This human made a waterfall there and I'm going to try to enjoy that. Yeah. Yeah. No, no. Uh, this is a large, a larger conversation. I've mentioned this even in joking passing, uh, uh, passing through on the show before here. Uh, um, I'd like someone smarter, clearly, that can uh, then put a sentence together, not, not like me here, um, to, to analyze our, our connection to, like, what we want in endings, what we want in stories, and, and how time and time again, endings so often break us as fans. Uh, mm-hmm. I, I'm, not a f- I'm not familiar with the show, but my fiance is, but, I, you know, Killing Eve just wrapped up, uh, starring uh, Ray's mom there, Jodie Comer. And there's so much debate and talk around oh they did they the ending was bad the whole last season was bad and and again i don't know the details of it but i i just would love i don't i just would love to study where that comes from our expectations where we want that river to turn and why we can't let go of it and and doesn't mean every show has been perfect uh maybe you didn't like the seinfeld characters ending up in a prison and a jail cell i don't know <laughs> i did but you know it's just we have have that connection. Think of anything big. There's been, in the occasion you'll get someone go, oh, this is, they, they did this one right. And even that can be debated. But you know what I mean? I, I, there's no, I don't have an answer. I just want someone to study why that happens time and time again. I think that that, that is such a, a great, a big question to have uh, about the way we process stories. Um, but yeah, so we should dive into it deeper. But I, I always think about lost um, I haven't seen it for years. I am not mm. a Lost expert, but I remember being really satisfied by the ending of Lost because I felt like the characters all did the thing that they deeply would do and needed to do and wanted to do. And then like, yeah, the 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 answers to the mysteries were like, yeah, whatever. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And that yeah. was that was one of the like um it, I remember that Lost ended around the same time that Battlestar Galactica did. And like oh, I right. thought I thought I thought in Lost, like some of the answers in the mysteries were like, yeah, sure, whatever. But the mm-hmm. characters fulfilled their journey. So I liked the Lost ending. Mm-hmm. And then the Battlestar Galactica ending was like a lot of cool conceptual things happened. But I just kind of felt like well, mm-hmm. I, I don't know that the character. Why did the character that would normally argue about that decision for a season and a half <laughs> mm-hmm. Just agree to that. So I and I, so I think maybe a part of it uh, from that example is just who we are as individuals. Of like I want I yeah. care more about the character stuff in this story meaning than the answers. Yeah, yeah, it, yeah, and, no, uh, yeah, yeah. And and I think that's a fascinating part of that how we process endings. What do we want? Yeah, that yeah, the Battlestar one. You'd need a documentary on that. What happened and how that? Yeah, it's, it's fascinating. I, I I agree with you. Yeah, interesting. Yeah. I don't know. Again, right. I don't know the answers. That just it factors always into Star Wars conversations. It really, really does. Yeah, a lot of lot of big ones, including you know a lot of the uh, the tension about the sequel trilogy of should it have just been a happy ending, <laughs> right. the Ewoks dance and leave it alone. Yeah, yeah, yeah. A great uh, discussion. For another time, as Maz Kanata would say, uh, that is our episode, Questions of the Force. Ken, do you want to let people know where they can find us? I'd love to. We're the Force Center Podcast. You can find us on Twitter at Force Center Pod. We're on Instagram, YouTube as well. We'll have another live Q&A show soon. We'll let you know when. Facebook page is Force Center Podcast. Podcast available on Acast, iHeartRadio, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, and more. Just search. You'll find us. Merch available at tpublic.com slash user slash Force Center. Go there and get your Speculate Responsibly t-shirt and wear it before you see the first episode of Kenobi at Star Wars Celebration. Uh, Patreon.com slash Force Center is where you can support us directly. You can follow me at Ken Napsock. Go to my website, KenNapsock.com. From there, you can link to tickets for a big, cool upcoming show if you're SoCal based, June 4th at the Troubadour, Doug Weston's Troubadour in West Hollywood. Be performing on a big comedy show there uh, with Mark Ellis hosting and Ryan Sickler headlining there. Uh, That is uh, for me. What about for you, sir? Yeah, you can find me Twitter, Instagram, TikTok is at Joseph Scrimshaw, and you can check out all of my other comedy adventures, past, present, and future, on my website, josephscrimshaw.com. But for now, for myself, for Ken, for R2-D2's Potty Mouth, this has been Questions of the Force. Oh, yeah.